My guest today is Jason Fox. Jason, how you doing? Good, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, you know what? I was really distressed recently. I was, uh, I was in Texas. We were having dinner, and I mentioned th- my show, this show right here, and I was surprised to discover that you have never been on my show. I just assumed you had. I, I totally forgot because we've known each other for at least six years. Yeah, I know. It's a little bit surprising. Um, uh, but... <laughs> I, I blame myself. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's uh, let's talk about spatial computing because I know you've yeah. uh, it, we used to work together, but now you've gone on to a startup and you're heavily involved in this. Yeah, that's right. And I um, just to give some context, like we worked together on the same team at Microsoft off and on for since 2014, right? I think, and then uh, yeah, or something. Like I, joined in, maybe. I joined in 2013, yeah. and I think you yeah, joined yeah, almost exactly the same time. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, several rounds on the on the same team, and then later on, uh, you know, I got to specialize in in the last few years in Microsoft in what we call spatial computing. Um, and what that means is the technology that enables a computer to understand the real world, right? So taking in uh, camera streams, other sensor streams, lidar, um, IR based depth finders. Uh, what, was that, what was that word? LIDAR? What is that? LIDAR. Uh, it stands for light distance and ranging. Hmm. And so if you think of a, uh, kind of the way radar works, where it sends out a electromagnetic signal and it bounces back and, and measures the time back, the time of flight back to the, the source, um, it does it with light instead, hmm. um, or, or a different spectrum of light, I should say. And, and so uh, th- those devices are becoming more and more prevalent in even just regular camera stream now, like on the back of your phone, for example, um, if you've got an iPhone, a later an, uh, a later Android or a later iPhone, um, it has the technology built in to take that camera stream off the back of the phone and kind of give you an orientation of where you are in space by scanning it around the room, huh. right? And so, um, and and so that's kind of what spatial computing is. It, it enables, uh, I, I like to say it as a, a set of technologies that enable other technologies, so like augmented reality, for example, uh, virtual reality now, both make use of spatial computing technologies. Uh, the, the pointed example from Microsoft is the HoloLens platform, right? Wow. And now they've got HoloLens 2 out in the wild, um, and it's each one of the two versions of that device are very, very good spatial computing devices. Like they're uh, they're excellent at giving the computer, which is the device that you wear on your head, a sense of where you are in a space. Okay? And to be able to do that, it has to understand the shape of the space, the geometrical shape of the space. Okay, and it's using things like yeah. LiDAR to do that. Uh, the HoloLens does not use LiDAR. Oh. Um, it uses a combination of what we call SLAM, which is simultaneous location and mapping. Mm-hmm. So if you ever look at one, <clears throat> I wish I had one to show, but yeah, I wish it's I actually did it's, at the, it's at the office. But yeah, but it looks like goggles. There's, yeah, there, there are four cameras on the front of it, um, and they're constantly watching the environment. Um, and they're kind of like low-res black and white cameras because they don't need a lot of detail. Uh, and so it ends up crunching that data really quickly um, to the tune of, you know, so I think it's maybe close to a gigabyte per second of data that it can process uh, through, through special hardware. But anyways, it's really good at understanding the shape of the space you're in and where you are in that shape. So if you were to take a box, you know, let's say a, a five by five meter box or five meters cubed box, and then be able to pinpoint where you are in that box. Okay, right. how far away is the wall in front of you versus how far yeah. away is the wall to your right? Exactly, how far are you off the floor, hmm. you know, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so um, that's the the most pervasive use of spatial computing today. And like I said, to, to some degree, your iPhone or your Android is capable of it just by this camera on the back. Okay. 
uh, the I, new iPads. I think we, you and I have the same model. It's an iPhone X. Yeah, the new iPad Pro that just launched a few weeks ago. It actually has a LiDAR sensor on it now. Oh. If you can see, it's right here in the, the camera sensor pack. Okay. Um, and so it's able to return a, a mesh, the shape of the room you're in, very, very quickly, within a couple of seconds. All right. Uh, so yeah. this is, you've talked a lot about the hardware being able to detect the shape of the room and the shapes of objects in the room and where you are in relation to them. Uh, what do we do with that information? What kind of applications are being used to make our yeah, lives better? I, yeah, so the currently I think the 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 most uh, pervasive use of it is like what we consider augmented reality experiences on mobile devices. Define that augmented reality. Right. Um, so if I were to overlay digital content on the real world, so let's say I have a, the camera stream coming in from the back of my phone, and then I overlay a piece of digital content. Right. Typically, it's a it's a 2D flat screen, and so it has no concept of depth or the shape of the room that you're in. Um, and so, what spatial computing does for AR is it allows you to understand that there's a you know a tabletop in front of you, and now you can place that virtual object on that tabletop, right? Um, and you know, uh, some very popular examples would be like Pokemon Go. Uh, that's an augmented reality application. That certainly and makes my a, life better. Yeah, in a couple of different facets. <laughs> um, it, not only does it do what I just said it does, like it can place Pokemon around in the room uh, using AR capabilities, but it also uses um, mapping data. Right? So if you think about a map being a pretty close to one-for-one -one representation of the real world from a top-down perspective. Okay. They've taken that data and they've they've put a skin over the top of it, hmm. a digital virtual skin, right? And so now you have real-world points of interest, so like the uh, the pavilion down, at, down the, at the park down the street from our house um, is a Pokestop. So in the game, you walk around and you collect objects from these Pokestops, and they give you it gives you things that you need to play the game, like Pokeballs to catch Pokemon, and et cetera. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so the application not only knows about uh, the area around uh, Dallas Fort Worth where you live, or the pavilion right there, but it also mm -hmm. once you get there, it knows where the fence is and where the um, you know where the benches it, it, are. And it, it's not quite to that level of understanding, but. Okay. <clears throat> it, it, you can turn on AR mode, which is the camera pass through, and and see a Pokemon kind of bouncing around in the real world environment. Now, I see. Uh, it makes it a little. It's more challenging to catch the Pokemon that way. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's interesting. It's a bit novel, right? Um, it's not really. I mean, I guess you could say Pokemon Go kind of helps improve people's lives because it it. Uh, it gets people out walking there right, you go. To, to go catch Pokemon. So some physical Good exercise. activity comes out Dist of it. <laughs> distracts us um, from the madness of the world right now. <laughs> yeah, and the the you know, maybe the, the example that makes a little more use of the, the digital overlay is actually Minecraft Earth, which is a recent release from Microsoft and the the team at Minecraft. Uh, it's a mobile app. It's very much like Pokemon Go. It has the, the map overlay, mm -hmm. and then it has AR mode where you're actually building uh, a Minecraft world, kind of, a, a segment of a Minecraft world at a location. Mm -hmm. And so it's combining the two kind of geospatial, it's what we call the mapping data, and then the spatial computing, which is the local understanding um, and so if you think about, I, I like to break them up into coordinate systems, actually. Uh, so um, you have your geospatial coordinates, which is a kind of where you are in the world. You know, the giant ellipsoid that we live on called Earth. Uh, and then once you figure out, kind of pinpoint where you are in the Earth, and now 
like translating that into a local coordinate system that a computer can easily understand and calculate against. Hmm. Right. So. Uh, now, there's some other applications besides just gaming. Uh, yeah. In fact, I think your your startup does something with. Space yeah. Space yeah. Space, right? We. Uh, yeah. So we we're actually we're combining um, machine learning, or kind of the marketing speak AI, with spatial computing to build out what I call basically it's a reality modeling engine. Um, so if you think about all of the sensor streams, we kind of already have active like security cameras, for example. Okay. Um, we, we, have a, we have all this data coming in and we have ways of, of consuming it, right? You, you have a security guard that can be watching a, a bank of security cameras and kind of understand what's happening. Uh, at some level, but if we apply machine learning to that, the machine learning can tell you, first of all, things you may not see or a human may not see, and then it can scale like en enormously, right? Um, and so you can have AI or machine learning watching many, many camera streams at the same time. Okay. More, th more than... That's looking humanly for, possible. Maybe looking for unexpected activity, like an unauthorized person being there, or uh, yeah, something. that's actually down a little. Yeah, it's it's pushed down into the system a little bit. But the camera is more of a sensor input device, okay. right? And then we have a we have a spatial computing engine that takes that camera stream, and which is in two D, right? And it's two D, and it has a perspective of the world. Okay. Uh, and we we happen to know exactly where that camera is located in the world. And we also happen to know the shape of the space that it's located in. So it's kind of back to my explanation of what spatial computing is. We have that upfront understanding of the shape of the space or the geometry and then where that camera is located. And now when it detects something, let's say like a person, we can tell you exactly where that person is in the space. And not only that, we can tell you how many meters away from the camera they are in XYZ, but we can also tell you their la latitude and longitude because we also know the geospatial coordinate of that camera. Okay, well, what's the practical application of knowing all that? Uh, it's it's more about um, discoverability, uh, understanding exactly where something is, right? Let's say you had a piece of equipment that moves around your, your site, uh -huh. your facility, right? Um, you know, GPS trackers have been deployed for decades, but they fall apart once they go indoors because oh, they, okay. they don't have a direct link to a satellite. Yeah. Um, and so being able to tell someone where exactly in their site something is, and I'm talking about where, you know, if in your house, it's probably not a, it's not useful. Right, it might be. I, I can't count the, more and more <laughs> as I've been late because I couldn't find my keys or my eyeglasses. <laughs> Here's, here's the lat long of your coffee maker. Um, <laughs> well, no, coffee maker doesn't, that's probably not, doesn't not very move useful. As much. But, <laughs> um, but, I do misplace you know, for, things. For other things, right? People, things that move um, either fairly frequently or, or even infrequently, right? You might want to know that that someone moved that that generator over to the other side of the facility, right? Sure. Um, so, anyways, that that's kind of the. The application um, that yeah, we're, maybe, we're working maybe, on, maybe where um, the where the forklift is in a large warehouse. Sometimes you yeah, know, one or two. It could be things really like that. Like yeah, uh, and so you know the idea is we're we're taking in all of these sensor streams and you know uh, security cameras is one. We're working on some others as well um, that to give a real a real world view of uh, what's happening in 4D, which is what we call like 3D with a time element, a time oh. dimension. Okay. Right. So, 3D over time, basically, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, so you can see what all happened in your space at your site in 3D over time, and you can kind of rewind and replay. You have live. We have live capability. Um, so that's that's what we're working on at Worlds, um, and it's it's a lot of fun, you know. To, to be thinking about these problems on a daily basis, um, and 
you know, we've solved some really difficult challenges in the past few months um, because this is all some of the, what we're doing is is kind of net new development. Like we, mm-hmm. there's no there's no ready built SDK on the market. Um, you know, there's no API that we can hit, no web API that we can hit from a platform provider or anything like that. So we're having to build our own platform for a lot of this. Yeah, and you're also combining a lot of uh, technologies and a lot of really high tech technologies, like machine mm-hmm. learning and spatial uh, spatial computing. Those are those are non trivial things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, go some more re- kind of real world examples off the top of my head, or like in uh, the construction industry, right? <clears throat> Being okay. able to overlay a BIM or, or sorry, a 3D model, like a CAD model uh, of the, the building that let's say the construction crew is working on, kind of overlaying it over the what the work in progress, right? Yeah. Um, kind of see what it's going to look like or um, compare it versus what it looks like today, right? There's a lot of work been done in that, especially around headsets like the HoloLens um, and construction software companies. Yeah, I've always thought that, that this uh, this idea of prototyping is a great use case for mixed reality. In the past, we used to have to build the thing before we knew what it looked like, and then we started drawing pictures right. of what it looked yeah. like because that's cheaper. Yeah. And three D models, and then CAD models, and now we can <clears> actually project a three dimensional vision of of a house, for example, or maybe just redecorating a room, which is much faster and much cheaper than yeah. actually building the thing and then deciding you don't like it. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's or, or not just it might just be an aesthetic thing, and maybe oh, you know what? It, I didn't realize on, in the model that this won't work because there's a tree trunk that goes through here that it just didn't right. really show up in my until I projected it right on this, so I can't put the foundation there. Yeah, no, no, it's exactly right. It, <clears throat> it enhances our ability to to design to understand the world in a slightly different perspective than we normally are used to, right? <clears throat> when you, <clears throat> excuse me, a little frog in my throat. Um, when you start to overlay the capability of a computing system on top of what your understanding of the real world is, it, it really has the, the potential to enhance, you know, everything. Yeah. Um, you know, what, one of the side projects that I work with is a a nonprofit organization called Open AR Cloud, and when I say AR Cloud, obviously AR is augmented reality. But the term AR Cloud was coined a couple of years back. It's kind of refers to what I've been talking about in terms of systems that enable broad use of AR in the world, right? And so, kind of walking around uh, the mall, for example and being able to have a headset on or smart glasses and then see that that digital overlay of the future you know that's been promised to us in sci-fi novels for decades <laughs> uh is is that that's kind of that grouping of technologies we call the ar cloud uh enabling that persistent digital overlay uh, it, there's been a lot of movement towards that here recently facebook announced something uh, like a few months back, Microsoft's been building some technologies related to it with their Azure Spatial Anchor service, <clears throat> for example. Um, I'm not familiar with that service. What is that? Uh, it it right now it allows you to set a <clears throat> excuse me set an anchor in the real world. Um, so it's telling you about how a device can kind of understand the space you're in and the shape of it, the the geometrical shape. Well, uh, what that does is create a nice Cartesian XYZ coordinate system. And you can say, you know, within this, the box of this room that, my, uh, that I'm in right now, the shape, I'd like to anchor a piece of content at this XYZ coordinate. Okay. And it saves that, it saves that off to the cloud, hmm. right? And then it allows you to recall that anchor at a later point in time, either on the same device or on a, another device even. So you can sh- start to share these locations with other oh, devices. Oh, very cool. Right. Um, then so you can th- have, those are you the, have multiple users 
accessing the same virtual yeah. reality. Exactly. Yeah, that that virtual overlay uh, that that AR promises. Uh, that so companies are, are definitely working towards incrementally building this future. That kind of uh, <clears throat> there's a, a Netflix series that that portrays this pretty well. It's called Altered Carbon. Okay. Um, and they have this I've device it, they wear in their it. eye. They have this communication device that they wear in their eye. Uh, it's like a contact lens, and it creates this kind of di- digital overlay of the, the real world, right? Mm-hmm. And then that, that device has access to all this AI kind of back-end infrastructure hmm. uh, to help them move about and understand things. So Interesting. That, that that's kind of... I'm starting to get off into futurism now, but the thing is the AR cloud technology um, is enabling or it's starting to enable these types of scenarios, right? And um, that's what we're working on as well, right? The stuff we're building, like I, I like to call them little, like private AR clouds because they're for specific customers today. Um, you know, my, my vision for that is eventually after we get the platform built out, like to start opening that up to other types of users um, and and really building a platform out of this uh, that, that helps everyone. But um, so it's probably a few years down the road, if I'm honest. You know, we're only a small company right now. <laughs> yeah, and it's a, and it's a yeah. non-trivial problem. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So you, now um, you've been studying spatial computing for for years now. There's a lot of people watching yeah. this that are brand new to it. Uh, can you recommend a place for them to get started to learn more? Ooh, yeah. Um, can you think back that far when <laughs> when you were a novice? No, it's yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I got started just out of a out of necessity. I was working at this company, and we had a lab inside of Lockheed Martin here in, in Fort Worth, and they they had this device um it's called a structured light sensor and it this was like 12 years ago i think and um they they were using it to scan in the shape of uh, airplane part you know, so aircraft part um and so i started playing around with that and you know experimenting with how we could use that shape and then align it with cad bottles from the engineering team um, and so that really started my foray into like what spatial computing was we didn't call it that then uh, this spatial computing is a, a term that's just popped up here in the past two or three years um, but it's a it's a good it's a good term it really sums up the the capability of the technologies involved um, but yeah Kind of, uh, I, I got started, I, I don't think there's really a, a go-to source. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it's still a pretty, a fairly immature segment of the technology industry. Um, you know, th- there's not all these kind of courses out on Coursera or anything about it. Um, but I would say to get started, just start playing around with something like ARKit or ARCore on, on your mobile device. Um, most, most people probably have that uh, access to something like that. Um, go to the uh, the AWE, which is the Augmented World Expo Conference page. I think it's awexr.com. And they, they link to a lot of their videos uh, or recorded sessions from the conferences. And you might see me a couple of times. I've spoken at two of them in the past year. Um, yeah, yeah, so I got turned down for a speaking slot at that one. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, um, that conference series, they, they, they run it here in the U.S., they, they run it in Europe, and I think they've started one in Asia as well. It's kind of the de facto industry conference for spatial computing now. Um, it's been going on for a decade, right? so kind of when uh, when augmented reality first people started first playing around with it and building libraries to enable it on on smartphones back in the day, um, 
that's that's when it kind of came about. Um, but yeah, and AR and, and VR are obviously they've really come on here in the past like four or five years, right? And even with VR headsets, I have a I just actually happen to have one out right now. Uh, the, these two cameras on the front do pretty much the same thing I was describing with the HoloLens. They do slam mapping, right? And so they're they're constantly watching the environment and generating that shape of that understanding that I was talking about, um, so that it can kind of it can set up what they call six degree freedom VR experiences. So you can you're not just sitting stationary and rotating your head around, which is called three degree of freedom or three degrees of freedom. Um, it allows you to stand up and walk around in your room that you're in or in the space that you're in um, and, and not bump into walls, for example, or trip over things. Well, it still might trip over things, but at least you won't, at least you won't run into the wall. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Yeah. All right, Jason. Well, this has been really fascinating. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Yeah. You're welcome, David. Thanks for having me on. And I hope you and your family stay safe during these crazy times. Yeah, you too. And uh, congratulations to your son on the, the coaching job and all that. That was great to see. Uh -huh. Hey, friends who work in technology. Uh, I just want to say that we have a great deal of power to affect change in humanity. And I think about this pretty frequently, we should use that power to really do good. And so I challenge you in your daily jobs to think about the work that you're doing and the effect that it could have on humanity as a whole, or seek out side projects that could be doing good things, uh, you know, uh, for humanity.